Okay, good. Well, shall we start then? Okay. So uh, today we'll focus quite narrowly on the uh, idea of amplification. So uh, this is uh, one more comment on the complementary nature of opposites as uh, illustrated by the yin-yang symbol. And it's related to what Jung saw as the essence of Greek wisdom. Exaggerate nothing. All good lies in the right measure. So yellow is the color of the mean in Chinese culture. And the reason that the Wilhelm Bain's translation of the I Ching has a yellow cover. Jung also quoted a related statement from John Glauer, a warring peace, a sweet wound, an agreeable evil. 那这个说明的阴阳象征所说明的哈这个对立面的互补性，那这个呢是与荣格所认为的啊这个希腊的智慧这个精髓有关，比如说第一个引言是这个巴巴拉汉娜哈他这本书里面所记录的，他说的是
So I gave several examples of the second part of the definition of the parallels from the human sciences in lecture two. Um, I illustrated the archetypes of the conservation of energy pro proposed as a scientific construct by Robert Meyer in the 19th century that has appeared in various cultural traditions in very different historical periods. As Jung said, the primitive dynamistic religions described it as a universal magical power about which everything revolves, the earliest form of a concept of God among the primitives. It is God appearing in a burning bush in the Old Testament. Uh, next slide. The Holy Ghost as fiery tongues from heaven in the New Testament, a world energy as ever living fire from a pre Socratic Greek, and Qi energy for the Chinese. 那对于刚才第二个这个定义当中的第二个部分也就是这个与人文科学的相似之处哈这样的一个部分在第二讲当中哈我举了几个例子那比如说那其中的一个例子呢是跟这个能量守恒的这个原型有关的那这是一个有关
呃，就是这些神圣的这种意象，比如说啊、呃，由一个神呐、啊、或者上帝为代表的。So the next slide. So Jung picked up on the original form of God as spirit, meaning wind, looking at the Hebrew ruah and the Arabic ruh, meaning breath and spirit. Amplifications like this make an individual feel part of our species' history and traditions. It helps us get out of our personal ego-bound world and puts us into the community of humankind as it deepens our sense of self and feel a connection to a more universal, archetypal, and timeless realm. 荣格，呃，在他的这个书里面对案例的这个诠释当中，捕捉到上帝是精神啊这一种原始的形式。那这个意思呢，就是哈，上帝是风啊，这个精神就是风哈。那这个他们是啊，也可以说是来自于希伯来语和阿拉伯语啊。那这个风啊，就是呼吸和精神的意思。那像这样的一个扩充，能够让个体感觉到自己是我们物种历史和传统的一部分。它，我们做扩充啊，它能够帮助我们走出个人的自我约束的世界，将我们带入人类的共同体。因为啊，这样的一种扩充的形式加深了我们的自我意识，并且感受到我们与更普遍、原型的、永恒的领域的联系。So, not mentioned in the definition of amplification is what Jung called quote, the method of the necessary statement. End of quote. He was referring to mathematical re,、um, expressions of relationships that go beyond empirical comprehension and compared the elaborate formulation of mathematical concepts to quote, the disciplined imagination to build up images of intangibles. By logical principles and on the basis of empirical data, that is, on the evidence and dreams. End of quote. Quote the method of the necessary statement. Unquote. Jung said, can most easily be demonstrated by the statement implicit in simple whole numbers. 那在对扩充的定义当中，并没有提到的是，呃，荣国所说到的一个必要陈述法。必要陈述法。那它指的是超越经验理解的对关系的数学表达，并且将数学概念的啊、呃、这个表述比作运用逻辑原则，以经济数据、以经验数据为基础，来构建扑朔迷离的事物的形象，比如说对梦的描述。那合理的幻想也是如此。荣格也说到，必要陈述法体现了是梦中的扩充原则。它同时也能轻而易举的通过简单的整数命题进行演示。这段有点拗口哈，大家可以在这一段是来自于《回忆梦思考》啊，死后生命的那一章哈，在后半部分大家可以去看。So the next slide. So one as the first numeral、um, is unity. But it is also the unity, the one, all oneness, individuality, and non-duality. Not a number, but a philosophical concept, an archetype, an attribute of God, the monon. It is quite proper that the human in the intellect should make these statements, but at the same time, the intellect is determined and limited by the concept of oneness and its implications. In other words, the statements are not arbitrary. They are governed by the nature of oneness, and therefore are necessary statements. End of quote. Jung also adds, theoretically, the same logical operation could be formed for each of the following conceptions of number, but in practice, the process soon comes to an end because of the rapid increase in complication, which becomes too numerous to handle. 这一段同样是来自于《回忆梦思考》的同样一个章节，前面的那一段是在这一段的哈，可能前两段吧，大家可以去看一下啊，这个纸质的这个书，呃，那我们读一下哈，这里面的一个引用，嗯、呃，那这个《回忆梦思考》里面说到一啊、呃，是作为
呃排序第一的数字哈、啊，就在数字里面，它是哈、啊、这个第一个数字，它是一个单位，那也是一个统一体。那这个统一体的意思呢，它是啊指的是一啊一体的，是个性的，是非二元性的。那这个时候啊，那这个一它就不仅仅是一个数词。那它啊、呃、是一个哲学上的概念，或者是说啊是一种原型，它还是神的属性，是单子。人的理智做出这些陈述，哈、啊，这当然很不错。但是人的理智也受限于关于一体及其啊这个意义的哈、啊、这样的一个概念。嗯、呃，换句话讲，这些表述并非随心所欲的，而是受制于一体它的一个本质的。那因而它是一种必然的表述，啊，在同一段当中，荣格继续说道，理论上来讲，相同的逻辑运算也适用于后面的数字观念，但实际上，这样的程序将很快走向终结，因为复杂情况迅速增加，数量啊极其庞大，没有办法估量。嗯、啊，那他也说到，数列同样是由单个数构成的。前十个数的特性，表示由单子构成的抽象的宇宙进化论。So Jung added the properties of the first ten numbers out of the infinite series of numbers represents an abstract cosmogony、uh, derived from the monad. 啊，那 that was just、um, kind of an addition. It wasn't on the last slide. 嗯，对这个部分，那呃,呃是上一段的这个延续哈，大家可以啊、呃、这个读的时候一起可以读到的。他说的是数字的特性同样也是物质的特性，因此呢，某些方程式也可以表征物质行为。So now we're on this side. So you mentioned. The properties of numbers are simultaneously the properties of matter. For which reason, certain equations can anticipate its behavior. Saying equations governing the turbulence of heated gases existed long before the problems of such gases had been precisely investigated. Similarly, we have long been in the possession of mythogens, mythological mythological mythologems. Which express the dynamics of certain subliminal processes, though these processes were only given names in recent times. 嗯，还是这一段哈，我们从第二行开始读。那这就像是表述热气不规则运动的方程，是在这个方程出现很久以后，人们才开始进行与这些气体运动相关的细致的研究一样的。那同样的道理。我们从很久以前就开始有了表现这些无意识过程的神话素材，但是这些素材直到近期才有了确切的定义。So the next slide. So think of how the archetypal motif in a fairy tale like Snow White long preceded the articulation of the psychological concept and psychodynamics. Behind the narcissistic wound and the narcissistic character disorder, here is an image of Snow White after she ate the poisoned apple from her mother, when her magic mirror said her daughter had grown to be more beautiful than her. The rational verbal psychological descriptions lack the intensity of feeling and associated imagery in the fairy tale, with a narrative that best captures the narcissistic personality. 那我们可以一起想一想，比如说像白雪公主这样的童话故事当中的一些原型主题，他们是如何长期阐述自恋创伤和自恋性人格障碍啊背后的这些心理概念和心理动力的？那图片当中我们看到的是哈、啊、白雪公主，呃，这个吃了她母亲的毒苹果之后的啊这一个意象，那是因为她的妈妈啊在这个魔镜告诉她，她的女儿比她长得更漂亮，妈妈给她了啊这个毒苹果。那理性的口头的心理描述缺乏童话故事当中那种强烈的感受和相关的意象。那这个
呃，童话故事当中的这种叙事方式，最能够体现自恋的个性。So the next slide. So with reference to the necessary statements about a particular archetype, compare the archetypal images of the great mother, pregnant or nursing, as generative and nurturing human nature, in contrast. To the generativity of the male as phallic, assertive, impregnating energy, mythologically portrayed by male fertility gods across cultures and historical periods, with the phallic side of Hermes being a good example from Western culture, and that's the famous Athenian Hermes statue on the right from about 500 BCE. 那前面提到了，呃，荣格的这个扩充定义当中，哈，呃，提到的一个必要陈述法，必要陈述的这一点。那在此呢，老师给我们举了一个例子，大家可以看到，左边的是母亲，哈，右边的是，呃，这个男性所呈现的同样的一种功能。那比如说，呃，这个大母神的这个原型意象所呈现出来的这种孕育呀、哺乳，啊，这是作为一个生育和滋养人的一种能量。那实际上啊，它在不同的文化和历史时期，啊，这个比如说跟右边的这个男性所呈现出来这个力量形成一个鲜明的对比。右边的呢是一个男性的生殖神，那这个神话所描绘的这个男性啊，他的这个生殖力是由阳具体现出来的。那同时呢，也呈现出来哈，他的这种有主见、孕育能量啊，也是通过他的这个哈生殖器。来体现的，我们可以看到哈，这个可以是形成一种对比的女性的啊，这种呃滋养啊、孕育的这个能量和嗯、呃、由这个男性的这个神所体验出来的哈、啊、这种生殖力啊，是由阳具、有主见的嗯孕育的这个能量。那赫尔墨斯这个阳具的一面是西方文化当中的一个很好的例子，比如说右边看到的这个著名的雕像就是雅典的赫尔墨斯。So the next slide. So Jung said that the I Ching is a book of archetypes. The I Ching has a binary code base, as depicted by the Fu Shi arrangement of hexagrams. The binary code being what computers run on. My hypothesis is that the I Ching is such a phenomenal book of wisdom and philosophy. Because China discovered the binary code very early in its history, and that shaped the thinking of the sages, artists, and philosophers. They were able to describe 4,096 archetypal situations in nature and in the psyche. 4,096 being the total number of combinations that one can have with six lines and four possible situations in each line. The first step toward putting the total abstraction of numbers into metaphors and imagery was to use yin and yang lines. That going back to Chinese shamanism in prehistory. Rong Guo 会认为《易经》是一本原型之书。那《易经》是以二极制为基础，啊，那就像是伏羲所画的卦所描绘的那样。二进制，我们也知道哈，它是我们现代的计算机运行的一个基础。那我的假设是，《易经》是一本非凡的智慧和哲学的现象之书，因为在这个《易经》在中国的这个历史上哈，呃，因为这个二进制在中国的这个历史上很早就发现了，并且呢，它也塑造了啊、呃、这个伟大的先贤、艺术家、哲学家的思想。我们能够描述自然界和心灵当中的四千零。九十六种原型情况，那这个四零九六哈，它的由来啊、呃、是用六爻与啊每爻所存在的这个四种情况的这个可能性哈进行数字排列啊、呃、这个排列组合所获得的啊、呃、这个数字，嗯，那将数字的整体抽象化为隐喻和意象的第一步是使用阴爻和阳爻，那这一点呢是可以追溯到史前的中国的萨满。So, uh, Coco, I'd just like to add that、um, so Jung called numbers the purest form of archetypes, and he described, as I mentioned before, 
how numbers uh, could predict the qualities and behavior matter. But he also said that numbers, and I think this is what the Chinese sages demonstrated, that numbers are also descriptive of archetypal situations in the human psyche. 那数字它有这个质的一面,这个质量的质,也呈现这种性质的一面,那同时呢它也和物质是有关的,那作为重要的一点我们对于这个数字的它象征意义的一种理解,就是数字呢它也可以说它呈现了对于我们的人的这种情
。那实际上我们说这个第三行，它更多的哈是和个体相关的啊，指的是我们在个体层面上跟个人相关的。那么到了这个第四爻，那实际上就是进入社会的这样的一种层面了。那啊，让老师也想到了哈，啊，就是脉轮。那第三个脉轮指的是和太阳啊，太阳力哈、啊，太阳的这个能量有关。那么到第四个脉轮就到了心轮了啊。那比如说那第三轮啊，也是处于啊，比如说就是在这种第三爻吧，它也是处于跟我们个体相关的一种面向。那当它能够啊突破个人的层面和。个人之外的人，比如说进入到第四爻哈，去发生连接、产生关联的时候，那实际上这对于个人来讲哈，是一个极大的转变。And that's why the sages often gave a difficult reading for that changing line in the third place. 嗯，或者是极大的过渡哈，未必是转，呃，是这种呃转化，是过渡极大的这种过渡，由第三行过渡到第三爻，过渡到第四爻的时候。那可能这也就是为什么啊，我们的圣贤在对我们这种变卦的这个解读之上，那、啊、通常会发生在这样的两个位置之上，或者是对于这些描述哈，让我们啊读起来是有一些困难的。So I gave a lecture on this two years ago, which has been translated into Chinese and it's available on my website. So the next slide. 嗯。那关于啊、uh, 这个易经这个方面的讲座链接已经发现，已经发给大家了哈。那个第二十三讲第一个链接，嗯，就是一个多小时的讲座，大家有兴趣可以去看，有中文翻译。So I used a diagram to illustrate how the sixty-four archetypal life and natural world experiences, the hexagrams, were developed schematically from the original yin and yang lines coming from the yin yang symbol. As the first manifestation of the Tao, that which points to the source, the origin of the ten thousand things. 那我将用一张图哈来说明六十四种原型生命和呃这个自然世界的这个体验是如何从最初的阴和阳当中发展出来的。那我们也知道啊，这个阴啊阴爻哈，这个阴和爻呃阳。它是源自于道的第一体现，那阴阳象征，它指向的是万物之源。So the next slide. And um, yes, so that's another illustration of the、uh, symbol in the middle,、uh, which doesn't really show a, a separation of the opposites. But you can see how the trigrams emerging from that, and eventually all of the hexagrams in the outer circle. 嗯，这是另外一张图表哈。虽然在这个图当中哈，这个啊看上去这个对立面的对立面阴阳还没有完全分开，但是这些卦象都围绕着这样的一个中心呢。啊，我们可以看到有这种内圈和外圈。啊，那到外圈它更多的是这个组合起来。So the next slide, and this is、um, another image of that. The supreme ultimate would be that white line at the bottom, and then you see yin and yang, and eventually at the top, all of the hexagrams. 嗯，所以这个就是我们所说的哈，太极生两仪，两仪生四象啊、嗯，然后再是八卦啊、嗯，它的这样的一个形成过程，推演过程。So the next slide. So this is a photo of a Taoist a priest robe, and you might notice the hexagrams on the bottom. And、uh, if you could point out that above that that lower band, it looks like kind of there's there are waves kind of parting and sort of like a phallic image moving up toward a dragon. 大家看到的这是一个道袍，道袍上啊一个部分的这种截图。那老师看到的呢是中间的蓝色和黑色圆圈当中的白色，看到吗？
最中间，嗯，对着我们的这个部分哈，是中间的这个蓝色和和黑色圆圈当中的这个白色是一个天鹅头，啊、嗯，白色当中哈可以看到最中间是白，然后是蓝，最外圈是黑，那它可以被视作是一个圆头的一个意象。So the next slide， 啊，那后面我把这个话再说一下哈，那在西方的神话当中。呃，那这个举着阴阳象征的是那个龙，啊，那在西方文化对应的是赫尔墨斯，赫尔墨斯他是过渡空间的神，在这种情况下，存在与不存在，啊，就是赫尔墨斯会在哈、啊、存在跟啊这个不存在之间进行过渡，那他首先呢会是以一个阴阳象征的象征化形式进行呈现的。I'm thinking of the dragon boat festival here. All these dragons around. Okay, I see this. Go ahead. Sorry, sir. Ah, 赖老师想到我们今天啊这个所说的呃我们的端午节哈龙舟龙的这个意象。I see the swan head within the white circle, within the blue and black circles in the middle, as an image for the source, the origin. Or what Lao Tzu called the Tao, the dragon holding up the yin yang symbol would be Hermes in our Western mythology because Hermes is the god of the transitional spaces. In this case, the transition between existence and non-existence, first presented in symbolic form as the yin yang symbol. 我已经提前念完了哈，大家再看一下这个意象吧。他说到天鹅头的那个部分，似乎是源头，就老子所说的这个道，万物哈都是从这里生发出来的。然后呢，他也说到哈，那这个阴阳象征的这个龙，对应的是西方的赫尔墨斯，那这个也是以哈这种阴阳的象征做一个呈现。You might point out, could you go back to the previous slide? So here you see how that kind of phallic-like figure came out of those waves. <coughs> Excuse me, and that led to this Hermes symbol surrounding that kind of swan image in the middle. <coughs> 嗯，我们如果这个往大里看哈，就是把这个目光啊、呃、放大一点，似乎就是这个龙啊。这个部分，或者是天鹅，它轮廓的那个部分啊，似乎呈现的是一个羊具，像羊具一样的啊，这样的一个图案。那这个呢，也会让老师想到哈、啊，和这个赫尔墨斯有关。And then to the next slide. And you will notice that there are four dragons around、uh, that Hermes figure and the yin yang symbol. That would be Uh, then you could show the next slide after you describe this. 大家看到了吗？在围绕着这一个哈、啊、赫尔墨斯一样的这个形象，有四条龙。So the next slide. So those four dragons would be like on this chart: summer, spring, autumn, and winter. Uh, those four phases in any cycle of change that I illustrated in that video, Seasons of the Soul, and I think you have a uh, the uh, a Chinese version of that presentation that is online. 嗯，刚才说到的前面的那一幅里面哈，他看到了四条龙。那么如果是对应到我们中国的意象当中哈，就是啊这一个太阳，啊这个老阳哈老阴，少阳少阴啊。这个我们的第三行呈现的是哈，互相相应的对应于中国的四季，春夏秋冬。那大家也可以去看啊，我们发的老师那个链接里面的第二个视频，它那个里面啊，就是指的是我们的这种人的心理变化可以呼应于自然的哈、啊、这种季节的变迁。那他的那个讲座的那个主题哈、啊，是跟灵魂的四季啊，以这样的一个主题来呈现的，也是有中文翻译的哈、啊，大家可以去看。And again, the diagram showing the emergence of consciousness, discriminating between things as the yin and yang lines coming out of the yin yang symbol. Like I said, I developed this hypothesis in some detail in the Orange County 
Friends of C.G. Jung lecture that has a Chinese translation. 同样的这个图表当中也呈现了意识的出现 so for those of us familiar with and loving the I Ching, it becomes an important source for amplification of imagery in dreams and cultural phenomena like music and film. We Western Jungian analysts envy the Chinese for the many, many avenues for working archetypally and imaginally out of your rich cultural tradition, beginning with the fact that many of your words still have an image base. 那对于我们这些熟悉和喜爱易经的人来说，易经成为扩充梦中的意象，以及像音乐和电影这些文化现象的重要来源。那我们西方的荣格分析师很羡慕中国人，因为你们丰富的文化传统当中有很多原型和想
啊，那他啊是在这个犹早期的这个犹太教当中，最早的时候啊，他也是一个啊这个士兵，是一个武士。So the、uh, next slide. So the book that I have with the most comprehensive description of the many dimensions of the I Ching. That can be used for amplification is the Book of Changes in the Unchanging Truth by Taoist Master Ni Hua Qing. So then, in the next slide. 这是老师用到的一个哈，这个常用的一本，嗯、呃，这个对于易经的一个解读。那他在很多维度进行了非常全面的一个描述，可以用来做扩充分析。那这本书大家可以去看哈，我没有查到这个人的中文的名字。啊，他的这个著作全都是英文的这个形式，拼音哈，貌似是倪华清。啊，这个清楚一点。There you see the yellow emperor looking at a tortoise, ah,、uh, or a turtle coming out of the river. I'm not sure which, and it has,、uh, I think it has the trigrams inscribed on its shell. 嗯。封皮上画的是皇帝哈、啊，然后一个一个龟啊朝着他走来。或许这个部分呈现的是哈、啊、皇帝所做的事情，去观察啊这个龟甲上面哈、啊、它上面的一些啊这个意象哈、啊、或者是裂纹。So the next slide. So Ni has one hundred and twenty pages. Of charts and diagrams describing the dynamics within the I Ching, in terms of number symbolism, astronomy, meditation,、uh, solar and lunar cycles, seasonal phenomena, etc. One can amplify by using Ni and the attributes of the trigrams using this chart that lists for each of the eight trigrams a feature in nature, a quality of energy, a season. Family member, psychological state, and body parts. How cool is that? So maybe you could, as you're translating this, kind of show、uh, four double pages and then stop on the last one that shows those psychological states. 嗯，好，我们可以先过一下哈，这几页，这几页呢都是来自于哈，刚才老师把它叫做倪大师哈，他是哈这个。修道的啊，呃，道家的啊，这个研究人物啊，那在他的这个书里面，这些都是来自于他那本书的这个插图。他的书里面有一百二十页的这个图表，那都呈现了哈这个不同方面的内容，比如说有呈现数字象征，嗯、呃，跟天文有关的和冥想、日月周期、季节现象啊有关的一些描述。那同时呢，他也使用了啊人们。是可以通过使用哈他的这本书，呃，这个以及去使用啊这个所描述的八卦的一个属性去进行扩充分析。那同时呢，啊，这个表还列出了八卦当中每一个啊，就是这种单卦里面哈，他们所呈现的一些自然的特性呀，代表的能量的质量啊，啊，所代表的季节、家庭成员、心理状态以及对应的身体部位，在他看来哈是非常酷的一件事情。画情哈，啊，谢谢文明。And then the next slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I guess it was、uh, each of the trigrams. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, I guess. Next one.、Hmm. No, it was.、Uh, did we miss a slide? I thought that there were. I had one of the trigrams, and the、um, no, it's the slide didn't make it in there.、Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so um, apologies there, but、um, I had a diagram in there、uh, for each of the trigrams.、Uh, showed a feature in nature, like、uh, wind or water or whatever, a quality of energy. A season, a family member, a psychological state, and a body part. Those associations with each of the eight trigrams, and I said, 
that is something that you can use for amplification. And it, uh, like I said, it's something that um, we Jungians in the West really envy the Chinese for being able to amplify by showing how um, an image, uh, one archetypal image can be as, uh, connected with uh, seasons, with nature, with meditation, uh, maybe with tai, uh, tai Chi positions and so on, uh, how one can have this complete gestalt of experiences for a particular archetypal image that you're amplifying.那其中有一张他想去呈现的就是我们这八个单卦能够与我们的一个四季呀，与自然呢，啊，或者是与冥想的状态呀，或者是哈，以太极的太极图啊，这个去做关联啊，去做啊一些扩充。他觉得哈，这是大家可能比较天然的这样的一个部分。So uh, the next slide. So this I used a uh, no the the previous one. There we go. So I used a Native American medicine wheel concept in my book, Land, Weather, Seasons, Insects, and Archetypal View, which is volume four of the Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe, to illustrate a central concept in the I Ching, the four phases in any cycle of change, spring, growth, harvest, and trial. Richard Wilhelm called it supreme success, furthers, and perseverance. Um, you have been provided with a link in that video, Seasons of the Soul, that I showed at the 8th International Conference on Analytical Psychology and Chinese Culture that amplifies those four stages using imagery of weather and seasons, my family members, and cultural myths and rituals. So one can amplify dream images and other archetypal material using the association of the four terms with Using the east as an example, a direction, east, season, spring, color, yellow, animal, ego, psychological state, light, illumination, um, a life cycle, stage, birth, phase in a cycle of change described in the Yi Ching, spring, and a psychological function, thinking. Uh, the intense series of dreams I presented at the Sand Clay Therapy Conference in China in December is an excellent example of the power of directions for putting order into a long dream sequence. And you can Google dreams, the I Ching, and the psychoanalytic process with a Chinese translation. <laughs> 适合这个生态学有关的一本书任何变化的周期都会有四个阶段就是这个字面意思翻译过来就是春天成长收获考验这个阶段魏礼贤会把这四个阶段翻译成元亨利贞那我们发给大家的这个链接里面就会有这个视频讲的是灵魂的四季是
，比如说我们以东方啊这个图表当中的右边的这个部分东方为例，那如果在方向上来讲，指的是东方；季节上来讲，对应的是春天。颜色啊，黄色为代表。那如果是动物呢？啊，用鹰来啊代表。心理状态啊，指的是光，或者是啊这一个呃。啊光是阐释哈，我们的心理状态啊，就是这种意识啊，偏意识的这种面向。那生命周期对应的是出生啊，就是以这个部分为例哈，跟大家来介绍。那么在易经当中所描述的变化周期的阶段，比如说啊，对应的是春天啊，还是以这个为例。那心理功能对应的是思考功能，所以哈、啊，它是在书里面是这样写的。那在这个。呃，链接里面啊，也呈现了一个很强烈的一个梦境啊，一个梦境。那这个梦呢，说明了哈、啊、这个方向的一种力量。那也呈现的是将秩序放入啊一个漫长的梦境的序列当中。那大家可以去啊，在谷歌上哈、啊、去搜索，比如说，这应该是他的那个。讲座吗？我问他一下哈，这个名字叫做《梦、易经》以及心理分析过程啊，是有中文翻译的。呃、uh, ，Sorry， Dennis， the the title you mean the dreams, the aging, and the psychoanalytic process is the video from you, right? Or it's a book video? Um, the dreams, the aging. Uh, yes, um, that is um, that is uh, that was a recording of the uh, presentation I gave uh, last November. I think it was shown at that Chinese Sand Play conference in December. It's been uh, recorded, and um, I th I th I think it yes, it was translated into Chinese. So I think that should be available. Yes, it's available. Uh, on my uh, website, and presumably it's available on some website that you would have as well. Mm. But it's a great example of the significance of directions uh, and the order it produced into a year and a half of a very complex series of dreams. And those were the dreams I presented last fall in China. Mm. 呃，这是去年啊、呃，这个沙盘游戏大会上老师所做的一个报告。他说，可能在我们的这个网网络上哈，大家能够找到，嗯，这个报告的啊、呃、一个录像，嗯、呃，或许已经配上了中文的翻译哈，或者大家也可以在我们的啊、呃、这个喜新岛的那个网站上看看有没有哈。那在那个里面，它就是呈现了这个方向的啊这样的一种力量，然后也举了他临床的一个例子，嗯，就是在这个来访者他的这个。工作来访者的系列梦，一年半之后，哈，他们出现的一种理解，感兴趣的大家可以去找一下，在外网上哈可能会有啊，但是也不太确定了，找找吧。So Coco, I think this would be a good、uh, time. Maybe you could、uh, close down the the、uh, slides, and then、um, it'd be an opportunity for people to ask some questions. Before we go into this second part, this was the most theoretical part here, and I want to make sure people have an understanding of、uh, of this material. 嗯，好，那我们前面呢，更多的是理论的啊，这样的一个部分的分享。我们现在停一下，看看大家对于老师讲的内容啊，有没有什么问题？那老师也想确保哈，大家啊能够理解到我们讲的内容。后半部分哈、啊，可能偏啊这个实操一些。大家有问题吗？这个发文字哈，或者是打开摄像头语音讲都可以。Paul not see the set the full line, so would you please comment on it? Since、yeah, since they have was, knowledge about it. That was a concept important. The young, the monad was like a. My understanding is is like this self-contained unit. Um, I don't know what mythic system that is from,、um, but like I said, it was、uh, it was a term that Jung often used. But it's it's basically、um, it's kind of like a spiritual and philosophical 
concept part of that gestalt of the meanings of one and unity and non-duality and that sort of stuff. But I don't know what a symbolic, particular symbolic tradition that is from. If I, I, I presume it's something from maybe a Western a mythic tradition. Uh,那这个单子的这个概念哈 呃，那老师不确定，就是这个词，那它的这个缘起是从哪一个传统当中来的？它猜测或许可能是来自于西方的啊神秘主义传统的，就是荣格是从那个里面引入过来进行使用的。但是这个术语啊，蛮重要的。
and time can go forward and backward. It's, it's something of, of that realm. And I kind of think of that level as being like the Hermes realm and, and just the, the first manifestations out of the, out of the Tao.嗯这个是不是跨课哈老师说嗯从根本上来讲哈从这个基本的单元基本的这个单位来讲应该是但是因为他对于哈这个我们说核物理哈他并不是啊了解太多那他说啊这个啊我们的这个 就是比如说对于哈这种核物理学啊，它是有更多的一种体会的。那老师说他之前看过一个电视节目啊，这个电视节目就是讲的是，比如说跟这种量子物理是相关的一些部分。那对于这种时间而言啊，就是这种量子物
啊、呃，或者是核物理学的这种学家，他们说的是在什么量子的啊这种背后哈、啊，或者是底下是啊我们的这种二元的啊，就是这个刚才所所说的那个是这个，我看一眼啊，我一下子说不上来了啊，二进制，它下面是一个二进制的那样的一些编码。当时老师听到的时候是很震惊的哈，就是如果啊是这样的话，那不就是中国的这些圣贤们是波粒二象性吗？好像不是，嗯，他说的是这种二进制，嗯，是这些就是这就呼应了哈，中国圣贤哈他们所做做出来的一些发现。So Coco, I think we should move on. I want to be sure to get through the main part of the presentation and then have some time at the end. So this will be pretty straightforward stuff、uh, from here on.、Uh, yeah. Do do we need a break today? Or not?、Uh, well, yeah. Would would they like a little break? Ah,、uh, 老师说他今天早上已经喝过茶了哈。看一看大家，我们今天要不要休息？如果不休息，我们就直接继续后面的。<laughs> yeah, someone proposed to have a five-minute break. Okay, let let's do it then. Okay, 好，那我们休息五分钟哈。嗯，那二十三回来。Excuse me, uh, Dennis. Yes. Um, you know, can you photo photograph the the page you showed us about the monad just now, and then you know maybe we can refer to it. You know, make a further study of it. Uh, uh, Take a photo of that page since I don't have that page,、uh, that book in hand.、Um, take a photo of the the that particular part,、uh, but then send it to you now. Do you mean? Or later? Is that okay? Later, sure. I can I can I can send it to you later, but I'll put it in my appointment book so I can be sure it happens. Thank you. It's, Thank you. It's a wonderful. It's an essential resource、uh, for Jungians if you're doing amplification, because then you can see what Jung said about that particular concept. And like I said, there were about at least twenty listings for the monad、mm. in the general index. Mm. Mm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Are there many? Ah,、oh, 好，老师下了。One more comment on the complementary nature of opposites, as、uh, illustrated by the yin yang symbol, and it's related to what Jung saw as the essence of Greek wisdom: exaggerate nothing; all good lies in the right measure. So, yellow is the color of the mean in Chinese culture, and the reason. That the Wilhelm Bain's translation of the I Ching has a yellow cover. Jung also quoted a related statement from John Glauer: "A warring peace, a sweet wound, an agreeable evil." So here is my、uh, very well used、uh, copy of the I Ching. It's kind of falling apart. Whoops! Been using it since 1975, but this is the yellow cover that the、uh, English. Translation of the Jing comes in. So the Greeks couldn't distinguish between the goddess truth and the goddess deception,、um, because there is an element of mystery in every truth. Deception supports ambiguity and prevents knowledge from being threatened by any one belief from becoming absolute. So、uh, let's look again at Jung's definition of amplification. So if you could get the next slide. So amplification is defined as the elaboration and clarification of a dream image by two means. Directed association is the spontaneous ideas which proceed from a given dream situation and constantly related to it, and second. The parallels from the human sciences, symbology, mythology, mysticism, folklore, history of religion, ethnology, and so on. 
So I gave several examples of the second part of the definition of the parallels from the human sciences in lecture two. Um, I illustrated the archetypes of the conservation of energy pro proposed as a scientific construct by Robert Meyer in the 19th century that has appeared in various cultural traditions in very different historical periods. As Jung said, the primitive dynamistic religions described it as a universal magical power about which everything revolves, the earliest form of a concept of God among the primitives. It is God appearing in a burning bush in the Old Testament. Uh, next slide. The Holy Ghost as fiery tongues from heaven in the New Testament, a world energy as ever-living fire from a pre-Socratic Greek, and qi energy for the Chinese. So another example I gave was in Jung's discussion of the woman who dreamt of her father as a giant of a man holding her like a little girl and rocking her as the wind swept over the wheat fields. Jung amplified her passionate longing for a godlike figure with the 13th century German mystic Mechthild of Magdenburg, who wrote ecstatic poetry and allegories about her love of God. Then Jung mentioned the pagan nature demon of Norse mythology, Wotan, the great musician of the gods and the god of poets and war heroes. This is an example of what Jung called the religious function of the psyche, that even in dreams of a non-believer, um, it can produce these uh, sacred images like God-like images. So Jung picked up on the original form of God as spirit, meaning wind, looking at the Hebrew ruah and the Arabic ruh, meaning breath and spirit. Amplifications like this make an individual feel part of our species history and traditions. It helps us get out of our personal ego bound world and puts us into the community of humankind as it deepens our sense of self and feel a connection to a more universal, archetypal, and timeless realm. So not mentioned in the definition of amplification is what Jung called, quote, the method of the necessary statement, end of quote. He was referring to mathematical um, expressions of relationships that go beyond empirical comprehension and compared the elaborate formulation of mathematical concepts to, quote, the disciplined imagination to build up images of intangibles by logical principles and on the basis of empirical data, that is, on the evidence and dreams, end of quote. Quote, the method of the necessary statement, unquote, Jung said, can most easily be demonstrated by the statement implicit in simple whole numbers. So one, as the first numeral, um, is unity, but it is also the unity, the one, all oneness, individuality and non-duality, not a number, but a philosophical concept, an archetype, an attribute of God, the monon. It is quite proper that the human in the intellect should make these statements. But at the same time, the intellect is determined and limited by the concept of oneness and its implications. In other words, the statements are not arbitrary. They are governed by the nature of oneness and therefore are necessary statements." End of quote. Jung also adds, theoretically, the same logical operation could be formed for each of the following conceptions of number, but in practice, the process soon comes to an end because of the rapid increase in complication, which becomes too numerous to handle. So Jung added the properties of the first 10 numbers out of the infinite series of numbers represents an abstract cosmogony uh, derived from the monad. The properties of numbers are simultaneously the properties of matter, for which reason certain equations can anticipate its behavior, saying, equations governing the turbulence of heated gases existed long before the problems of such gases had been precisely investigated. Similarly, 
we have long been in the possession of mythogens, which express the dynamics of certain subliminal processes, though these processes were only given names in recent times. So think of how the archetypal motif in a fairy tale like Snow White long preceded the articulation of the psychological concept and psychodynamics behind the narcissistic wound and the narcissistic character disorder. Here is an image of Snow White after she ate the poisoned apple from her mother when her magic mirror said her daughter had grown to be more beautiful than her. The rational verbal psychological descriptions lack the intensity of feeling and associated imagery in the fairy tale with a narrative that best captures the narcissistic personality. So with reference to the necessary statements about a particular archetype, compare the archetypal images of the great mother, pregnant or nursing, as generative and nurturing human nature, in contrast to the generativity of the male as phallic, assertive, impregnating energy mythologically portrayed by male fertility gods across cultures and historical periods, with the phallic side of Hermes being a good example from Western culture, and that's the famous Athenian Hermes statue on the right from about 500 BCE. So Jung said that the I Ching is a book of archetypes. The I Ching has a binary code base as depicted by the Fu Shi arrangement of hexagrams, the binary code being what computers run on. My hypothesis is that the I Ching is such a phenomenal book of wisdom and philosophy because China discovered the binary code very early in its history and that shaped the thinking of the sages, artists, and philosophers. They were able to describe 4,096 archetypal situations in nature and in the psyche, 4,096 being the total number of combinations that one can have with six lines and four possible situations in each line. The first step toward putting the total abstraction of numbers into metaphors and imagery was to use yin and yang lines, that going back to Chinese shamanism in prehistory. Jung called numbers the purest form of archetypes, and he described, as I mentioned before, how numbers uh, could predict the qualities and behavior matter, but he also said that numbers, and I think this is what the Chinese sages demonstrated, that numbers are also descriptive of archetypal situations in the human psyche. So with the six line hexagrams, the sages were able to play with the archetypal significance of upper and lower, as with the trigrams, top and bottom, as with the lines in the trigrams, corresponding be correspondence between lines, natural yin, and yang positions, etc. The host of descriptions available to English speaking people uh, in the structural descriptions of the meaning of the hexagrams in the third section of the Wilhelm Baines translation of the I Ching. And what is I've always been struck with is by the uh, third and the fourth lines. So you're going from the lower trigram to the upper. And notice that the third line is about the individual and the fourth line is social. And in the chakras, the third, the third position is associated with the solar complex and like power. And the fourth line is associated with the heart. So when you go from individual to being able to relate to somebody else, that's a huge transition. So I gave a lecture on this two years ago, which has been translated into Chinese and it's available on my website. So the next slide. So I used a diagram to illustrate how the 64 archetypal life and natural world experiences, the hexagrams, were developed schematically from the original yin and yang lines coming from the yin yang symbol as the first manifestation of the Tao 
that which points to the source, the origin of the 10,000 things. Yes, so that's another illustration of the uh, symbol in the middle, uh, which doesn't really show a, a separation of the opposites, but you can see how the trigrams emerging from that and eventually all of the hexagrams in the outer circle. And this is um, another image of that. The supreme ultimate would be that white line at the bottom, and then you see yin and yang, and eventually at the top, all of the hexagrams. So this is a photo of a Taoist a priest robe. And you might notice the hexagrams on the bottom. And uh, if you could point out that above that, that lower band, it looks like kind of there's there are waves kind of parting and sort of like a phallic image moving up toward a dragon. I see the swan head within the white circle, within the blue and black circles in the middle, as an image for the source, the origin, or what Lao Tzu called the Tao. The dragon holding up the yin yang symbol would be Hermes in our Western mythology, because Hermes is the god of the transitional spaces. In this case, the transition between existence and non existence first presented in symbolic form as the yin-yang symbol. And you will notice that there are four dragons around uh, that Hermes figure and the yin-yang symbol. That would be, so those four dragons would be like on this chart, summer, spring, autumn, and winter. Uh, those four phases in any cycle of change that I illustrated in that Video seasons of the soul, and I think you have a uh, the uh, a Chinese version of that presentation that is online. And again, the diagram showing the emergence of consciousness, discriminating between things as the yin and yang lines coming out of the yin yang symbol. Like I said, I developed this hypothesis in some detail in the Orange County Friends of C. G. Jung lecture that has a Chinese translation. So for those of us familiar with and loving the I Ching, it becomes an important source for amplification of imagery in dreams and cultural phenomena like music and film. We Western Jungian analysts envy the Chinese for the many, many avenues for working archetypally and imaginally out of your rich cultural tradition beginning with the fact that many of your words still have an image base. My favorite example that I learned in a private study group in Zurich was the ideogram for the sage described as, quote, the ear listening to the inner king, unquote. This describes the process of becoming and being a sage rather than describing the attributes of a sage, how ingenious. This illustrates the power of the image with the inner king in Jungian terms being the self, which, as I mentioned before, could be a spirit animal or, for me, a sacred landscape. Engineering professor here, Chinese engineering professor here in Milwaukee, told me that the, the king is that lower line with a cross on it, and he said it represented a warrior who became a chief. So uh, the idea of an inner king as the warrior chief would be related in American Indian culture to somebody like Black Elk that I mentioned in an earlier election. So in Judaism, uh, it would be like King David, who was a famous uh, warrior king in uh, ancient Jewish culture. So the book that I have with the most comprehensive description of the many dimensions of the I Ching that can be used for amplification is the Book of Changes and the Unchanging Truth by Taoist Master Ni Wat Ching. There you see the yellow emperor looking at a tortoise uh, or a turtle coming out of the river, I'm not sure which, and it has, uh, I think it has the trigrams inscribed on its shell. That is, uh, that was a recording of the uh, presentation I gave 
Uh, last November, I think it was shown at that Chinese Sand Play conference in December. So I think that should be available. Yes, it's available uh, on my uh, website, and presumably it's available on some website that you would have as well. Mm. But it's That's a amazing. great example of the significance of directions uh, and the order it produced into a uh, year and a half of a very complex series of dreams. And those were the dreams I presented last fall in China. See the set, I, the third line. So would you please comment on it since, yeah, since they have was, knowledge about it? That was a concept important. The young, the monad was like, a, my understanding is it's like this self-contained unit. Um, I don't know what, mythic system that is from. Um, but like I said, it was uh, it was a term that Jung often used, but it's it's basically um, it's kind of like a spiritual and philosophical concept, part of that gestalt of the meanings of one and unity and non-duality and that sort of stuff. But okay, here's here's the answer. Here's the uh, general <laughs> index to the collected works. So I looked yeah. under Monad, and there's a lot of listings. First is Gnostic, as like the Anthropos, the first man, the son of man. It's from Kirch, uh, Kilchner's culture system. It's related to the Lapis, the Microcosm, uh, the Monogenes, uh, the Prima Materia, and Alchemy. Those are some of the main associations to the Monad. This is a, I will be mentioning this is one of the prime union works for doing amplification. Quark, Q-U-A-R-K. You know, theoretically, it is um, the fundamental particle, smaller than atom. Right, right, right. Yeah, that whole domain of nuclear uh, physics, um, it's, it's one of the, the fundamental uh, qualities. I uh, My knowledge of that area is not that great, but uh, some lecture by uh, Joseph Cambry, uh, who has a, a pretty good grasp, I think, of nuclear physics, would be a person to, uh, to think about, to think about there. Uh, what I might add is that um, I saw a public TV program about the very fundamental level of reality where I think it's called a quantum flux or something where things can come in and out of existence and time can go forward and backward. It's, it's something of, of that realm. And I kind of think of that level as being like the Hermes realm and, and just the, the first manifestations out of the, out of the Tao. Um, one of my images for the gap in Hermes wand um, is like the, the Northern Lights, what happens there. But I also kind of think of those uh, dragons, those Chinese dragons, it always seems like they're shimmering to me. And I kind of think of that as the, uh, uh, the, the clouds out of which rains and things like that come. But it's, it's something that you can't uh, like um, kind of physically grab a hold of, but there's some reality to it. So it's that relationship to Hermes as something that can appear and disappear. That's why I put Hermes, I associated Hermes with... Uh, that figure in the Taoist robe. I might add one thing, and like I said, I'm not that knowledgeable in nuclear physics, quantum mechanics, and so on, but I did hear something some years ago that really piqued my interest because of my interest in Yi Jing. I heard a mathematician or a nuclear physicist speculating that between, beneath the quantum flux, or the quantum reality, if you will, it's a binary, it's a binary uh, 
code or a binary existence. And I thought, oh my gosh, maybe those Chinese sages were right when they said that the book was created by men of cosmic intelligence. So, um, so what is most important is learning how to work with archetype symbols and archetypal imagery. So for this, I'm most grateful for my training at the original Jung Institute in Zurich. And this is the location in Kusnacht. We moved down there after the original site in Zurich. And um, that's where I heard from some of the last of the first generation of Jungian analysts. I think the most important thing for a Jungian analyst is to have an archetypal and symbolic eye. Um, there have been many times in my 40 years of practicing as an analyst that I have said something in a session about a symbol, and I thought to myself, I've never read anything about that symbol, but there is a symbolic logic to what I just said. Coco, I might add that uh, Lake Zurich is to the right um, and to our back. Uh, a few blocks up is Jung's house on the side of uh, Lake Zurich. And to the right also is facing to the west. So the main impetus for developing a symbolic eye was having to pass a six hour exam on fairy tales. You were given an exam, you had a fairy tale you'd never seen, and you can use all the symbol dictionaries you want to produce a written interpretation in six hours to be graded by three fairy tale experts. I practiced with a small group for over a year. Fairy tales are particularly good practice because Mary Louise von Franz called in the purest form of the archetypes and are more generic than myths. That's the building where I took my fairy tale exam, a top floor. On the left, that's the library. So I was in there for six hours. But what I, I just realized, and I'll try to diagram it uh, here, um, I woke up the morning of my exam, and at the end of a dream, I was given a hexagram from the I Ching. And then I was given a very simple form of it that I couldn't forget. And I'm drawing it out now. So hang on here. And I, I looked it up. It was a very positive hexagram. This is the image. That was the last form I was given for the hexagram, a block form. You can see it would be a changing line in the fifth place, which uh, changes to the creative. So needless to say, I did very well on my six hour fairy tale exam. This is the, the simple version of it. So there would be, um, on the bottom would be that big chunk. Initially, I was given four bold black lines and then a space for a line and then a big bold black line at the top. And yeah. then, so Dumbo, like me, won't forget it. I was given this simple form of just one big block on the bottom and one big line on the top. The hexagram is, is 14, uh, possession in great measure. Mm, yeah. And the changing line in the fifth place says, um, uh, he whose truth is accessible yet dignified has good fortune. So the situation is very favorable. I also had a dream one time where I was looking at various elements in the environment and I could see like a trigram uh, disappearing into those, those elements, like a bush or a tree or a river or something like that. I could see a trigram form and disappear into those different elements. First this morning, I also had a dream in Zurich where I was talking to a woman and there was sort of like a big kind of flattened balloon. And there was like a little statue inside. And I was telling the woman, like, with it, within every complex, there's a statue of a god, which would be like the archetypal base of, our, of a uh, complex would be like a, a god or a goddess. 
but that would be related to me seeing trigrams disappearing into elements of the environment because those trigrams are archetypal situations. So this is uh, uh, the uh, collection of Grimm's fairy tales, and those are the uh, fairy tales that we practiced on in my little fairy tale group. So an ideal place for Jungians to begin with amplification, <coughs> excuse me, is volume 20, <coughs> excuse me, the general index of Jung's collected works. Uh, one also needs a collection of good symbol dictionaries to amplify archetypal and symbolic material. So one of my favorites is a dictionary of symbols by Jean Chevalier and Alain Gerbrun that includes symbols from Asia and Africa, as well as Europe and America. So a book of symbols, Reflections on Archetypal Images, is a beautifully done and put together book by Jungians. So Medicine Cards, The Discovery of Power Through the Way of Animals by Jamie Sams and David Carlson is a must for American analysts because it has excellent Native American entries about 44 American birds and animals. The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara G. Walker provides a feminist dimension to symbolism not covered as well in many symbol dictionaries. So the classic for working European materials is the Dictionary of Symbols and Imagery by Ad de Vries. This is the main dictionary our fairy tale group used as we practiced fairy tale interpretation, mostly on the Grimm's fairy tales, collected and arranged by the Grimm's brothers in Germany in the, 18, in the 1800s. It took me three days to work up each of four fairy tales for presentation to the trainees at the Chicago Jung Institute because I looked up the symbolism for every element in the tale. I photocopy the symbol descriptions for the students so they can get a feel for how to work with symbols and fairy tales. A powerful symbol like a snake has four pages of association in the frieze, and the lion has over two pages of associations. So here is an example of a little but very significant symbol in the fairy tale Cinderella. A twig of hazel that knocked off her father's hat and really was the turning point in the fairy tale. The first three categories under hazel, you see that on the page on the left, are the great goddess, knowledge, wisdom, poetic art, and love and fertility. So it is helpful to think of each symbol like a disco ball where every mirror on the ball is an individual association of that symbol. One then selects the particular association or associations for each symbol that fits the emerging storyline of the fairy tale. So the storyline is like the string that holds together all the relevant associations from individual disco balls to form a greater gestalt where every element is related to every other element in the story. So Cinderella is mostly about the cruel and inhuman treatment Cinderella received from her stepmother and stepsisters. And one of the associations for Hazel under the folklore category for Hazel is a quote, counter charm against witches. A branch was often put in a horse harness to protect it against evil spirits. So the method is re related to the first part of the definition of amplification, quote, directed association, and, uh, end of a quote, is the spontaneous ideas which proceed from a given dream situation and constantly related to it, end of quote there. But it applies more directly to how one works with an individual's association to the elements of a dream without many archetypal elements. One does not free associate endlessly to a particular word in the dream, but keep associations related to the storyline of the dream. One usually has to play around with a dream, a mutual process with the analysis until things begin to emerge. Even though I've been working with dreams for over 40 years, 
about half the time I have no idea what a, a dream is about when I first hear it. So a good docent will deepen a viewer's appreciation and emergence into a great work of art by pointing out and elaborating various aspects of the painting. Sorry, Dennis, what does it mean of the Dawson? Um, that's what this woman is doing. It's like when you go on a tour in a museum and you have an expert uh, describing what the painting is about. And so speaking of images and dream images in particular, I love what Jung had to say after discussing a case with dreams in volume seven. Okay, uh, so Jung said, all we have been forced to discuss here um, in such a tedious and long-winded detail, in order to understand it properly, the dream has condensed into a few vivid metaphors, thus creating a picture that works far more effectively on the imagination, feeling, and understanding of the dreamer than any learned discourse. Consequently, the patient was better and more intelligently prepared for the treatment than if he had been overwhelmed with medical and pedagogical maxims. For that reason, I regard dreams not only as a valuable source of information, but as an extraordinary effective instrument of education. So Jung said, on paper, the interpretation of a dream may look arbitrary, muddled, and spurious. But the same thing in reality can be a little drama of unsurpassed realism. To experience a dream and its interpretation is very different from having a tepid reset, rehash set before you on paper. Everything about this, which is Jung's psychology, is in the deepest sense experience. The entire theory, even when it puts on the most abstract airs, is the direct outcome of something experienced. So Jung um, described dreams as being natural products arising spontaneously outside of conscious control being therefore objective. They hint at, quote, at uncertain basic trends in the psychic process, giving a sense of objective causality and objective tendencies, which is teleology, because dreams are nothing less than self-representations -rep uh, of psychic life process. So I would add another aspect of amplification, um, and that is illustrated by how I worked with my sacred metal dream. I took that single image dream received over 41 years ago as hexagram one, the creative in the I Ching, which is about the spirit and inspiration. Hexagram two, the receptive, is to be guided by that spirit to embody it in space and time. So this is symbolically depicted as squaring the circle. The image for the creative is a circle and a square is the image for the receptive. My amplification has been to study the many dimensions of the natural environment in Wisconsin, its landscapes and seasons, which I continue to do as illustrated by the two minute video I did for the opening remarks for the Sand Play uh, Conference in China last November and December, and that's on the internet. So land, weather, seasons, insects, an archetypal view is basically an amplification of the meadow dream. On the back cover, I describe the process of working the meadow dream as, quote, turning a landscape into a soulscape, end of quote, through the use of science, myths, symbols, dreams, Native American spirituality, imaginal psychology, and the I Ching. Adding that, it is, an, it is an approach that can be used to develop a deep connection with any landscape, meeting one of the goals of eco-psychology. I want to emphasize that this illustrates amplification in its broadest sense. So you can see why I chose this image for squaring the circle. If a man's anima is the image of his soul, squaring the circle for me would be embodying the sacred meadow dream, hexagram one to hexagram two. 
And so ends my presentation on amplification presented to you from my embodied position here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Shay Shay. Maybe you could quickly just flip through the rest of the slides so people will know what's there. Uh, talk about properties of organa orgasm, orgasm, right? Organism. Um, and then um, complexity theory. Hermes is the god of complexity theory. And um, uh, a chart illustrating various things about Hermes. And um, just keep on flipping through it. And um, I might just add that, um, uh, that um, like I said, this is far beyond amplification, but um, a big interest in the planet right now is in artificial intelligence. I know that's one of the areas, one of the 10 areas that Chinese are really specializing in. And um, one of the more unique aspects of that is called emergent phenomena. And that is directly related, as I see it, mythologically to Hermes. So I think Hermes is going to be a kind of a mythological framework for this very important aspect of artificial intelligence. So let's have some time for some questions here. <laughs> And Xinqing has a comment in such a comprehensive illustration of the amplification. Yeah, I kind of expanded on Jung's uh, definition, but you can see the influence the I Ching has had on me in um, what I consider to be personally my most important amplification, namely of that sacred meadow dream in, in China that I had in China, Freudian slip that I had in Zurich. Coco, I might add that um, interest in the Yi Jing and the Jungian world is, is much stronger from kind of my generation of Jungian analysts. I, I know that a lot of the, the current generation and people training uh, really don't um, I get that much discussion, I think, about the, about the Yi Jing. But for people like John Beebe and myself, it's really pretty central to our lives, both personally and, and as analysts. So when the Yi Jing has penetrated your dream life, you know it is sunk in pretty deeply into your psyche. What's your thoughts about the relationship between dynasty and archetypes? Between what and archetype? Fate, fate and uh, archetypes. Between fate and and archetypes. Oh my God! Yeah, well, fate. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah, that would be a that would be a good hour lecture right there. Um, fate and archetypes. Yeah. Well, part of it would be. Um, kind of what you're born with in your genetic makeup and science is discovering that maybe something even as basic as introversion and extroversion and, and certain psychological traits are, are things that we're kind of born with as in individuals. So that would, that would be the, the most fundamental in your genes type of uh, fate. Um, and then, boy, then it it becomes uh, like a big spiritual and philosophical uh, debate with um, the many layers of the collective unconscious as something that one would have to take into consideration, like even just being born in America as a as a white male, you know, versus like being born in a in a a uh, Latin American a country that's in uh, chaos, uh, just the effects that that would have on your fate and your future. That would be the second dimension. And the third thing that comes to mind would be related to dreams and the I Ching. Um, and that is given the circumstances that you're in, what 
how do you best live with that and work with that? And like I say, that's where you get guidance from your dreams, but especially well illustrated by the Yi Jing, where the Jing tells you, it's been my experience and people like John Beebe as well, that, that, that the Jing tells you at a very deep level archetypally where you are and how to make the best of that circumstance that you're in. So just off the top of my head, those would be three dimensions that come to mind. Mm. Another question is related to your um, scientific background. You know, we know that you are an expert on the insects. And you know, do you think they, the, in, the psychology of the, um, the insect, insect, insects, insect, <laughs> it also can be interpreted with the archetypal theory. Oh, wow, I love that question. Yeah, um, uh, my last, um, hang on. That's why I chose this image for my last volume. And my last chapter in my last volume of the Dairy Farmer's Guide is called Planet of the Insect. So uh, I have diagrams and basic descriptions about insects. And James Hillman, one of the Jungian analysts I really admire, I wrote a fabulous article in spring, I think it was 1982 or four called um, Going Bugs. And he looked at the many psychological dimensions of insects in, in dreams. And I, I quoted Hillman quite a bit in my article. And one of the reasons I, as an entomologist, am so disturbed by the damage we're doing to the environment relates to what Hillman said. He said that, that insects have like a cosmic intelligence. They are tuned into the basic energies um, on the planet. So for various reasons, and I won't go into a lecture about it, but they're very sensitive to temperature and humidity. Um, and they're adapted to live in very a specific unique environments. And because they're so adaptable, that's why we have two thirds of our species are insects. So the fact that in Europe, the, the insect numbers have declined in some European countries by 25% to me is very disturbing as an entomologist. Yeah, Hillman wanted me to do my thesis on insects, but I had just gotten my PhD in insect pathology uh, when I got to Zurich, and I really wanted to put my entomology career behind me. But uh, you know, 30 years later, I I paid homage to Hillman and entomology, and the and I'm also a Pink Floyd fan, so the very last appendix in my very last book following praying mantis as a spirit animal is called Pink Floyd and the Fly in Life's Ointment. So I amplified uh, one of my favorite, two of my favorite Pink Floyd fans <clears throat> with, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, scientific knowledge about insects. So they're everywhere. Uh, you, you, and you usually don't see them until they become problems. Another question, you know, for you, that is, uh, do you believe in fate? Um, do I believe in, do I believe in, in fate? Um, <laughs> I would say yes and no, going back to my, my earlier, uh, my earlier, uh, <laughs> answer. And um, uh, I think basically where I come down 
is um, in terms of a position in life is is uh, gratitude for uh, the the good things that that I have in my life and that have happened to me and um, gratitude for for me uh, discovering Carl Jung and through Jung the the I Ching so it's it's what's what's more significant to me than fate, like I said before, is is um, is is knowing how to uh, fully live into the archetypal dimensions of one's personal existence, and to do that, uh, like I said, I find help from dreams and the, the I Ching to for being able to do that. So a lot of, of our, uh, uh, I mean, fate is, is, is like one dimension that sets some certain parameters, but what's more significant in a way is, is how we uh, live with the parameters that we've, we've been given and in what, to what degree we can modify those parameters to live more fully. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 那就像老师前面哈, 他给我们做的一个回应一样, 那他会觉得, 比如说对于命运而言, 呃, 那他首先会想到的是他的一个非常感激的一个部分, 他感激的是他生命当中, 呃, 这个, 他的生命当中所获得的, 哈, 所有的, 啊, 这种好的东西, 他, 有感激之情充分的去活出个人那帮助他在我们的个体的生活当中去过出充分的在原型的层面上也是过出更充实的这样的一种人生过充分的一个人生他说那命运可能是一种维度比如说那这个命运给我们呈现的是我我我可能要查一下哈，preemptor。So oh, I notice it's getting pretty late for you guys in China. Maybe I maybe I'll close by kind of saying a little more about fate. Um, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but um, it, it it does it, it is unusual and. Bit kind of uncanny at times, and then uh, with synchronistic events, even um, one I, I I have had the sense that 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 things have happened that um, have provided great meaning and direction in my life. And it's definitely not something that has come out of my conscious control, but it's um, it does give one sense of of being uh, guided on on a path with um, I, th I think of this as as uh, the way I describe the sage, kind of like guided on a path with heart and meaning, and that. That path, like I said, is is not under a lot of conscious control, 
But what is important is when opportunities when open to recognize them and and to really get into them and maximize them. It's like when I discovered Jung, it's it's like, whoa, this is fantastic. And then just some very powerful things started to happen that made it possible for me to go to Zurich and train. Mm -hmm. Uh,就是去调解,通过去调解我们这种被赋予的这种参数,去把我们的一生,哈,充分的活出来。或者是说这些发生在我们身上有意义的一些事情那实际上是我们要跟新的这种连接并且踏上这样的一条路这个非常坚决的去到苏黎世去进行受训可能这都是这个没有接触荣格之前他不会在理性上直接去做的一个选择 So Coco, uh, I could provide a link that you could send out to people um, uh, There's a young group in California that asked me to give two presentations on how I got from insect pathology to being a Jungian analyst So in the one hour presentation that they did record and it's uh, online, um, I described how uh, several dreams that I had helped make that uh, transition. And I even described how I used the, the I Ching um, uh, in a crucial situation that helped provide the money for us to go to Zurich. So I'll send that link to you and you can send it out to the students. OK,嗯,那老师后面也会给我们发一个讲座的一个链接哈,是他之前给加州的一个学习小组做的一个讲座,在那个讲座当中他是被当做这个他的这种背景当中哈,不是有这种昆虫学家这样的一种背景嘛
Thank you. Thank you. 大家可以把鲜花刷起来哈。对，我们可以啊，这个感谢老师。Okay, 谢谢。Thank you. Thank you so much.